Would you like to learn about the five main ways that you can get a green card through investing in a business in the United States? If so, stay tuned. I'm going to go through five of the most common options that people in your situation can use to make that happen. My name is Kehlani Hawksbia Franca. I'm an immigration attorney based in Austin, Texas, and I serve my clients throughout the United States and across the world um, as they want to pursue their dream here in the U.S., uh, build their business, move here with their families, um, and pursue the future they want to pursue. So if that's you, um, stay tuned and let's talk about it. Okay, so I'm sure that if you got to this video today, this is not the first time that you've thought about coming to the United States. It's not the first time you've thought about building a business in the United States. I'm sure that you've Googled Investor Visa USA in the past. So what are we gonna talk about today that's different? What we're gonna talk about today are the creative ways that I have seen clients successfully use a business in the United States to get a green card. There's only one obvious way to do that, but there are some other creative ways and I wanna talk to you about those options today. So. The first and most obvious way that you can get a green card in the United States through your investment in a U.S. business is known as the EB-5 green card option. In this option, you have to invest a large sum of money between a million and two million dollars. You have to create at least 10 jobs in the United States and you have to have a stable business that contributes to the U.S. economy with those minimum 10 jobs and the amount of investment that you have invested in your business. With the EB-5 green card, you absolutely can get a green card in the United States. It's the only obvious path to a green card that maybe you have found already if you've Googled USA Investor Visa. But I want to talk about some other options and that beca that's because this EB-5 option is not going to be a good fit for most people and let's talk about why. So first, there are two kinds of EB-5 visas. One is called direct investment, and the other is investment through what's known as a regional center. Let's talk about direct investment first. In the direct investment EB-5 program, you create your own business. Your own business itself has to generate at least 10 jobs. You have to employ at least 10 people in the United States, um, and you have to invest around $2 million or half that amount if your business is based in an underserved, dis like an uh, economically disadvantaged area of the United States. So um, even if that's true, that a million dollars is still a lot of money. Not everyone has access to that amount of money. Something else to keep in mind about this program. You may have read recently that you only need to invest $500,000 right now to be able to get this EB-5 green card. That may or may not be true. What happened is that written in the law, the amount of money you have to invest to get your EB-5 green card is um, close to 2 million or 1 million if you're in that. Um, underserved area. But right now, um, that law has changed and the total investments are half that even again, so that your total investment that you need right now is a million or 500,000 if you're in an uh, economically disadvantaged area. But that may not be true for long. So technically, right now, if you invest $500,000 in a business in an economically disadvantaged area and you meet that 10 employment requirement, 10 person employment requirement, you can file this case, but these cases take a long time to get decided. And it is very possible that the law will change again by the time your case is decided. And if the law changes before your case is decided and you've only invested the smaller amount, you're not gonna be eligible for the EB-5 green card. You're gonna have to invest double again and what you've already invested. So if you're not prepared to do that, I wouldn't pursue an EB-5 case right now. Um, the reason this is happening is because the current investment amount is what was part of the law a long time ago. Then Congress um, increased the investment amount that was needed. That, that increase, that um, legal change that resulted in the increase expired earlier this year, which means that we went back to the lower investment amount. However, at any point in time, Congress can again say, oh, oops, we let that law expire. Let's reauthorize it. And as soon as they reauthorize it, we'll be back at the higher investment amount. We fully expect that to happen um, anytime. So I counsel my clients um, to be aware of that and to know that risk before pursuing an EB-5 direct investment case. Now, I mentioned there are two kinds of EB-5 cases. You have your EB-5 direct investment. We just talked about what that looks like, some of the risks that may be involved right now. You also have an EB-5 regional center. The EB-5 Regional Center Program is on hold. It does not currently exist. 
So you cannot apply for a case through an EB-5 regional center right now. What does it mean when it's happening? It means that there are different centers around the United States where you can, um, you can invest through these centers and you still have to invest the same amount of money, but the jobs requirement may be easier to meet. And that's because instead of the direct investment where you have to show you employ 10 people, the regional centers help you create a business that can show you've had an impact on employment of at least 10 people, but you don't have to directly employ those people in your community. So it could be an easier path for some people. Not gonna go into it more today because it doesn't exist right now. That law was deauthorized and has not been reauthorized again. Um, so we don't know if anybody will be able to apply for regional center EB-5s in the future and, and what that program will look like once it restarts. So that is um, the most obvious, the most straightforward path to a green card through investment. It's the only kind of green card that actually has investment in the name. Um, so that's the obvious path, the path that most people think of when they think about an EB-5 green card. What are your other options? Now, there's another kind of investment visa. It's called the E-2 visa. I help many of my clients get E-2 visas to come to the United States and run their U.S. businesses. The E-2 is beautiful because it requires a much lower investment. There's actually no minimum investment amount and cases as low as $50,000 have been approved. Most of my clients spend around $100,000 or a little more um, and their cases are approved. So it's a much more accessible path to U.S. Um, to living in the United States and running your U.S. business. But an E-2 doesn't give you a green card. It only gives you permission to live and work in the United States while you run your U.S. business. Um, but an E-2 doesn't prevent you from getting a green card through another path if you're eligible. So what may be possible for some people is to get an E-2 visa through their U.S. business, come to the U.S., and really focus on building that U.S. business and grow it to the point where you're, where you're eligible for a different kind of status, a green card through your business. So let's talk about what those might look like. So um, in this scenario we're thinking about, you could get an investor visa, an E2 visa. If you have questions about what that looks like, I've done a lot of videos on that going really in detail about what's the E2 visa, who can get one, what are the risks? What do you need to do? Um, go check out my other videos on that. And um, we're not going to talk more about that today. Just know that um, for our purposes today, we're thinking about the person who starts with an E2 visa, who moves to the United States on an E2 visa, and then once here, from within the country, is able to apply for some sort of different uh, process that they might be eligible for. So what are those? So um, there are one, two, three, four I want to talk to you about today. So um, the first is called the EB1A. An EB-1A green card is for people of extraordinary ability who have risen to the very top in their field and can prove that they are one of the foremost experts in their area. This may be true for you if you're an entrepreneur and your business has um, things about it that make it very unique and very special. Um, and you in particular, your background proves that you are really at the top of your field of business and entrepreneurship. Um, so you could come to the U.S. on your E-2 visa, build your business. Building your business here would then be building the evidence for your EB-1A case. Um, and if you are eligible for an EB-1A, you can then apply for that from within the United States. Um, keep in mind, these EB-1A cases are very high standards. So you really have to be exceptional in your field to be able to get your EB-1A granted. There's no guarantee, um, but it's an important option to keep in mind if this is something that might apply to you, if you really, if you've won awards, if you um, are seen as an expert, if you present to other people, if people come to you as the expert in your field and look to you for guidance, you should be thinking about this kind of case. Okay, so that's one. The second one is EB-1C. EB-1C often is talked about in the context of an L visa because an L visa naturally leads to an EB1C green card. That's because an EB1C green card is a green card for managers, executives in multi multinational companies. So if you have a company abroad and you have a company in the US, you can transfer here on an L visa, but you can also move yourself here on an E visa. And sometimes that's a better option for my clients because the E tends to be faster, less risky, and um, less involved than the L visa, um, quicker and easier to get approved. So you can choose to come on an E, and that doesn't take away your ability to get your EB1C green card. 
once you're here, if you qualify for the EB1C, even if you're not on an L visa, you can pursue that EB1C. So that would apply to you if perhaps you have been um, working abroad as a high, at a high level in your company for at least the last year, for at least a year, sometime in the last three years at the point that you applied for the visa. Um, there are a lot more things to discuss about the EB1C, but this will give you an idea of if you would even be eligible. You have to have a business both in the US and abroad. You have to have worked in the foreign entity uh, for at least one of the last three years at the time you apply for the visa, uh, excuse me, the green card through EB1C. So that could be an option for you as well. Um, next is one that I really think is very interesting for a lot of entrepreneurs, and it's the EB2 National Interest Waiver. So the EB2 National Interest Waiver is available for entrepreneurs, investors, business owners, if they can show that their business has a is um, substantial in its impact to the United States and um, that the United States cares about this business. So this kind of case is really creative. It, there is no one way to say you are eligible or you are not. You really need a thorough analysis from a trusted immigration attorney. Um, but let's talk a little bit through what an EB2 national interest waiver case looks like for an entrepreneur, a business owner. So to get your EB2 national interest waiver, we have to show that you either um, have an advanced degree or you're a person of extraordinary ability. It's much easier to prove if you have an advanced degree. Um, you just have to show you, you have the degree and boom, that's the first part of the case. Otherwise, we have to go through the same steps that we go through for the EB1A, showing that you are a person of extraordinary ability. And that's a higher standard. Um, so keep that in mind. That's, that's part one. Part two, then, once you've passed part one, is you're either extraordinary or you have an advanced degree, is we show that your work is of um, substantial merit and national importance. So what does that mean in the context of entrepreneurs? Well, it can mean a lot of things. It could mean that your work um, positively impacts other businesses. So say you have a business that serves as other businesses and you are able to show um, a huge economic impact that your business has had on other businesses and help them function. Um, that would be considered a substantial impact. If we can then show that <clears throat> this positive impact on other businesses is of national importance. And we do that making creative arguments about the local economy, the supply chain, whatever industry that you're in and how you have propped it up and how it matters to the US. That's how we win that kind of case. So um, you can see that we can get really creative with these cases and that there are as many ways to make an argument as there are businesses. So and certainly not everyone is going to qualify for an EB2 national interest waiver. And I would encourage you not to think that everyone can. There are sometimes um, attorneys or um, immigration specialists, as they like to call themselves, who are not attorneys, who advertise EB2 national interest waiver cases to just about anyone and they charge huge fees. Um, and that's not what this case is. This case is not a case for everyone. Um, so if somebody tells you it's easy to win, I would walk away from them. But think about it and talk to somebody who is trusted and knows what they're doing to see if you could um, and make a good case for an EB2 national interest waiver. Because if you can, it can be a good option for you as an entrepreneur, a business owner with a successful business here in the US to prove that you, you the work that you do is of substantial merit and national importance and that you thus deserve a US green card. Now, what does it mean when we say waiver, national interest waiver? Well, that's the cool part about this case. What we're waiving is labor certification. Normally for an EB2 green card case, you have to get the Department of Labor to certify that there aren't any US workers who can do the job. Um, in these kinds of cases, we ask for a waiver of that requirement because of the nature of your work, because of how much it matters to the United States. And that makes this case so much easier, quicker, faster, better for entrepreneurs, because entrepreneurs often are not in the position to be able to go through the normal labor certification process, because that involves a different employer sponsoring your green card. Well, if you're an entrepreneur, you don't have a different employer. You're your employer. You own your business. And that's not an option for you. So this EB2 National Interest Waiver gives entrepreneurs the ability to self-sponsor and waive that labor certification process. Again, it's not super easy. It doesn't happen overnight. These cases can take a couple years even to process. Um, that didn't used to be true. Processing times have slowed down, but they can take a year or two to process now. So it's not, there is no immigration magic bullet. You can't snap your fingers and get something you want the next day quickly and easily. But that doesn't mean there aren't options. And so I want you to keep that in mind. If you are thinking about coming to the United States, investing in a business and running your business here, I want you to know that there are a lot of ways that you could eventually get a green card. 
there's no guarantee. You need to strategize with your attorney, but I want you to know that there are possibilities and you should explore them um, so that you can think about your future here in the United States and think about it holistically. Um, so you keep in mind your goals, your business, your family, your future, um, and think of all of that long-term from the very beginning when you first start your very first case. Um, a couple things to keep in mind as you're thinking about moving from say an E2 to a green card is that um, when there's no guarantee, none of these cases are guaranteed to be approved, right? So you gotta, you know you're taking a risk. That's true anytime you file an immigration case. If anybody ever guarantees you they can win a case, I think you should be concerned. Um, attorneys add tremendous value and you are much more likely to win your case with an attorney than without one. But no attorney can guarantee you're gonna win your case. So you, ha you have to be comfortable taking that risk. And that's hard, <laughs> but it can pay off really big. So that's one, there's never a guarantee. And two is that your E2 visa or any other non-immigrant visa with the exception of a few, but most non-immigrant visas, um, you have to show that you have non-immigrant intent. What that means is that you are not planning to get a green card at the time you enter the US with your E2 visa. Um, so you have to be careful on strategy here. If you are thinking about a green card long-term, you should share that with your attorney and make sure that the way you approach it, the way you're thinking about it, doesn't cause you to violate your current status. Because say you um, have an E2 visa and you enter the United States with your E2 visa, which is a non-immigrant visa. To get that visa, you had to sign a piece of paper saying you're not planning to live in the United States permanently, you're just coming temporarily to run your business. Even if temporary is 15 years, that's the standard for that kind of visa. So if you enter for the first time on your E2 visa and six weeks later you file a green card case, that could really be a problem. Immigration is gonna say, um, it looks like you lied to us when you said you weren't coming to get a green card. Um, so certainly, there's absolutely a way to do this where you can enter on your A2 visa, your circumstances change in the future, your business has built itself up, you've built your business, it's changed, it's grown, and now maybe you're eligible for something you weren't eligible for before, before at the time you applied for your E2. Um, and in that case, it could be completely appropriate to apply for a green card that you later become eligible for. But you wanna make sure that as you think about this from the beginning, you really think about non-immigrant intent, you talk to your attorney about what that means and how you avoid problems um, in that area so that you have success long-term with your immigration future. All right, so quick review. Your five ways to get a USA investor visa. We have the traditional route, EB-5 green card where you invest in a business in the United States, that business creates 10 jobs and you, you invest $2 million about, or a million dollars if you're in an economically disadvantaged area. That's the most common type of investor green card in the United States. Um, and the risks are not small, and so not everybody wants to do this. The other options um, to get your USA investor green card are to come to the United States on a non-immigrant visa, like an E2, to run your business, um, and then apply for other kinds of green cards that you may be eligible for in the future after being here in, a, in the US for a couple of years and building your US business. So those could be E1A, if you're a person at the very top of your field, um, EB1C, if you're a multinational manager of a multinational company, um, or E2 national interest waiver, if the work you do as an entrepreneur and business owner is um, in the national interest and has substantial merit um, for the United States. So these are things to keep in mind. Um, these cases are really complex, really detailed. So we can only just begin to talk about the surface of them in this kind of video today. Um, you should not make any decisions about your immigration future without talking to a, a trusted attorney who knows what they're doing. Um, so hopefully this has given you some ideas, some things to think about more, some things to talk about more. Um, if you'd like to talk to me about your options, give me a call. I would love to meet you. My phone number is here below. It's 512-675-2945. Or you can email us at help at hawksviafrancalaw.com. Um, one of my favorite parts of my job is actually doing the initial consultation with my clients um, because that's the time I get to hear about your goals, your vision, your excitement for your future, and really craft a strategy for you long-term for how you're gonna succeed. It's really fun to be able to help you um, craft this goal together, craft the strategy together to meet your goals. Um, so give us a call, we'd love to help you out. See you later.